Crossroads, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which is so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking into Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This morning, I want to tell you a story I heard this week by Dr. Tony Evans. He tells a story of a, a father. He had an appointment that he had to make. He, he had to a business meeting that he had to make it to. He had a destination he had to get to. And he had to catch a train to make his destination. He had to catch the train. And the train that he had to catch only ran once that day. He could only make it that one time to catch that train. Otherwise, he was going to have to wait to the next day, but he couldn't wait to the next day because he had an appointment he had to make that day. And so he uh, gets dressed, he's hurried, he's running late, he, he gets everything together, grabs his briefcase, and he goes to run out of uh, the door, and he sees his toddler in the front yard playing in a big mud pile. And so uh, and the kid is covered from head to toe in mud. It's wet. It's slippery. He doesn't have time to stop, though. So he just runs, and he leaps over his child. And he's, you know, going to make it to the car that's waiting to pick him up so he can make his train. But as he leaps, he trips, and he falls right into the mud pile. He falls right into it. And as he's sitting there in the mud pile and he's upset and he's distressed because now what am I going to do? He realizes that he has a destination to get to. He realizes that he has a meeting he has to make. He has some place he has to get. So he gets up, he does the best that he can to get the mud off of him, and he goes and he gets in the car. Meanwhile, the toddler, who had no place to get to, had nowhere to get to, he had all day to sit in the mud and play. So he stayed there happy as a pig in mud, just playing. But the dad had somewhere to be. He had a train to catch, a destination to get to, so he got himself up. And he made his way to the train in spite of falling down and getting covered in mud. Like that father, you and I have a place to be. We have a destination to reach. We have a destiny. We have a vision to walk in. We have a purpose that was designed for us by God, the creator of the universe, just for him. Amen. But before you and I can reach our destiny. Before you and I can get to the destination God has planned for us, we first must catch the train. We first must get on the train. So this morning, what's keeping you from getting up and making your train? What's keeping you from getting up and making the train to your destiny that God has prepared for you? Is it sin? Is it your past? Is it fear? Is it anxiety? Is it uh, complacency? Is it consistency or lack thereof? What is it that's holding you and I back from catching our train? What's holding us back when we should be pressing forward? What's keeping us from committing 100% and being all in? Those things that I listed, some of them will look at and go, well, that's not my problem, that's not my problem, and that's not my problem. But one of the ones that convicted me the most was consistency. Running out of momentum, feeling constantly defeated, running like a full locomotive, you know, going, chugging away, and then all of a sudden something bad happens, like falling in that mud pit, and instead of getting up and keep moving, you just lay there and wallow in it. No consistency. Start, stop, start, stop. Start, stop, start, stop. No consistency. That's something that keeps us from catching our train. Complacency, being stuck in a rut, feeling comfortable, selfish, and self-centered. They keep us from making our train. That focus on, hey, I don't want to cause a stir. I don't want to ruffle things up. Things are pretty good right now. I don't want to mess things up. I'm comfortable. That keeps 
keeps us from making our train. Fear and anxiety. A fear of stepping out. A fear of taking chances. A fear of getting out of our comfort zone. That anxiety that can sometimes paralyze people. A failure. But if you're not failing, you're not trying. If you're not actually failing, at some point, you're not trying. We all fail. At work, we have a, had a saying uh, where, you know, you've got all these people that never fail because they never do anything. But the fun time that someone messes up, they go all in on them and throw them under the bus. Well, the reason they messed up is they were doing something. They were attempting something. So without failure, then you're not trying. I'm not trying. So we got to not have that fear and that anxiety of stepping out and taking a chance to do something mighty for God. Amen. We learn from our mistakes and our failures. And my goodness, God knows that I have made my share of poor choices, my share of mistakes, and have experienced my share of failures. And I will continue to make mistakes and I will continue to fail. But ultimately, through those failures and those mistakes, I will arrive at the destination God has for me because He is growing me through that process. Don't be held back by your past. Bad decisions, poor choices that we've made, sin that we've committed in the past, or maybe stuff that people have done to you that weighs you down. A lot of us have baggage that we've picked up because of what others have spoken over us or because of what others have done to us and treated us. God does not want that baggage to hold us back from catching the train that He has for us and reaching the destiny that He's already pre-prepared for you and I to arrive at. So whatever is holding you back today, whatever is holding me back today, Jesus Christ can set you and me free. But we must not miss our train. Because when you miss the train, you miss the destiny that God has prepared for you. When you miss the train, that train may take detours. It may have to go a different way. It may have to switch directions. It may have to switch tracks. But it will make it to its destination. But if you don't make the train, you don't make the destination. And some of us are still stuck on the platform, unwilling to get on the train. Because we are afraid of the commitment and what will be required once we sit down and start the journey. But God has something so great at the end of the line for you and I that it is worth the risk of getting on the train. When you and I look at Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, it tells us how not to miss our train. First, he tells us in the first part of verse 1, Therefore also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, too many people have ran the race before you and I. Too many people have gotten on the train before and I for us to be content to mosey along and miss our train. Too many sacrifices made. Too many lives lost. Too many homes left. Too many feats accomplished by those in the past who are willing to step out in faith and accomplish the destiny and the purpose God had for them for you and I to take it for granted and not step out on faith and make our train. Too many people have suffered reaching their destiny for you and I to take it for granted. Amen. Too many people have given their lives for you and I to take it for granted. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11 is a whole a chapter of people who caught their train and made it to their destiny. Not all of them are rosy, peachy stories, but ultimately they were used by God to accomplish a purpose Amen. that only they could do when God used them. Amen. Noah built an ark and rescued his family. Abraham trusted God and God made his heirs into a nation. Moses rejected a life of privilege and God used him to deliver Israel. Joshua was obedient and the walls of Jericho fell down. The prophets sacrificed in obedience and prophesied the coming Messiah. The disciples followed Christ and became fishers of men. And Paul gave up his own life and he changed the world. All of them took risks. All of them took chances. Abraham picked up and left when God said, Get up and go to a land I will show you. He had to catch the train not knowing where the destination was. Amen. He simply had to get on 
So personalize in your personalizing in your life. Who has gone before you that sacrificed? Who made their train and walked in the purpose that God had for them and used them as an encouragement? Look at them as that witness who says, Look, if you will obey God, this is what can happen to you. Personalize it. Who in your life can you look to? I have people in my life that are those witnesses that have shown me that even through pain and through suffering, Riding the train to the fulfillment in God's purpose is worth the bumps and the road. It's worth the detours. It's worth switching tracks every once in a while. It's worth the ride because the destination is God ordained. And true fulfillment and true joy and true comfort comes from arriving at that destination. Amen. So many times we're unhappy in our lives because we are not going towards our destiny. Amen. Yes. And so God is constantly allowing trials and troubles. He's constantly allowing things to come in our lives that are trying to direct us. Amen. But instead of allowing them to push us onto the train, we fight back with all that we have. Yes. Amen. We fight getting on the train even though God is doing everything that he can do, sort of uh, short of controlling us directly to get us to get on the train. And we're miserable and we're unhappy because you cannot fight against God and win. You cannot fight against God and have joy. We cannot fight against God and have peace. So we're miserable in our lives because we're not trying to achieve the destiny of that God has made for us. We're not trying to walk in the purpose that he designed for us while we were still in our mother's womb. Before I was ever born, God knew me. God formed me. God had my days fashioned for me. So in Psalms 139. Yes, thank you, Jesus. So we need to look and find encouragement and not take for granted the sacrifices that others made before us. Use it as encouragement. Use it as a motivation to get on the train and to catch our <laughs> destiny. In my life, that person primarily is my mother. I've watched her suffer through the loss of two husbands. I've watched her suffer through family strife that she certainly did not deserve to have to go through. I've watched her suffer through her mom's sickness and die. I've watched all of these things, yet my mom remained faithful and true and stayed and got on the train and has written it. And God has blessed her in ways that you cannot even imagine. And God has blessed her children because of her faithfulness. And getting on the train and riding it in God's purpose and riding it to her destiny. You've got someone in your life yeah. somewhere, whether it's a family member, whether it's a friend, someone that has made the sacrifices, who has gone before you, that you can look to and say, it is worth it. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And the first thing you and I need to do so that we can make our train. As Hebrews 12, 1, the second part of that verse tells us, Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. We have to lay down all of the extra baggage and weight that's keeping us from getting on the train. Uh, I hate to fly for a number of reasons. One, because I always have to ask for a seatbelt extender, which is the most embarrassing thing you could possibly do. But there was a time when I packed my suitcase, I always took the giant suitcase because I packed 10 outfits more than what I needed because I was afraid something would happen and I would be stuck without clean underwear and socks. Thanks, Mom. Uh, so I would pack the giant suitcase. Well, the giant suitcase has to be checked. So you have to stand in line to check it. And then you have to go to the baggage claim and wait to finally get that bag. It is a big bag that is burdensome. You have to carry it to the airport, get it checked, you have to pick it up. And it literally can take an hour out of your life just waiting for your baggage to get there. 
Well, the last time that I flew, I decided to do it a different way. I got a carry-on bag. And I wadded up my clothes, and I shoved them in that bag as tight as they could get, and I zipped it up. And it was so nice taking that small bag, running it through the x-ray machine, putting it in the overhead bin, and not having to check it, and not having to wait for it in baggage claim. Right? It was so nice not having that extra weight that kept me from getting to my destination and kept me from, that kept me from being late, from getting there on time. So I had this light piece of baggage that I'm supposed to carry. See, there, are ba there is luggage you have to carry. Yeah. There is baggage that you do carry. There is luggage that you have to carry. There are things in our lives that we have to carry. But so many times, we hold on to things that we don't have to carry. Uh, I'm a pack rat. I save everything. I've, I've got cables and hardware from the 1990s, you know, saved up because I'm afraid to get rid of anything. Right? I mean, I've got stuff that can't. I've got parallel printer cables. I mean, when was the last time one of those were used, right? I have tons of junk. And my uh, wife, though, is the opposite. Like, if the boys have Christmas presents that haven't been opened within a certain amount of time, them jokers are put in the yard sale pile. And the next yard sale, they're gone. She throws away stuff. She'll go into my closet and go, nope, nope, nope. Well, honey, someday I might be 200 pounds again. Nope, nope, nope. Right? Uh, she just cleans out everything. Drawers can't be messy. I'll stuff it until you can't open it anymore. That's laziness, really. But I'll stuff it, and she can't stand it. She will clean out that drawer. Some of us are pack rats, and we keep a hold of things that have been laid upon us because we're afraid to let it go because we think someday we might need it. We hold on to it, and we won't let it go. It is baggage that is keeping us from arriving at the destination that God has for us. It keeps us from achieving God's purpose in our lives. There's this guy in the Bible named Bartimaeus, and I'm sure most of you have heard of him at some time or another. But Mark chapter 10 tells us about him. The verses 46 through 52 tells us that he was a blind man standing beside the road, and as Jesus passed by, he hollered out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stops, and I want to read for you verses 49 and 50. And so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you, and throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. Now he gets up, he goes to Jesus, Jesus heals him, and the Bible says he kept, after that point, following Jesus when Jesus restored his sight. Nowhere does it say he went and picked up his coat again. From the moment that Jesus healed his eyes, he started following Christ. And he left the past and the past. See, that coat to him was something special. One, it kept him warm. It would have been made of layers of layers of stuff and been patched and sewn together. And it would have been thick and it would have been dirty and it would have been smelly. But it kept him warm when he was outside on those cool nights. Uh, and, uh, and it kept him protected from the elements, the sand and everything that was happening. It was this heavy coat that he had to have because he was blind and a beggar when he was lost. Uh, in his blindness, he had to have that coat. It protected him. It was the insulation that kept him. But when Jesus Christ called his name, he realized, I don't need that coat anymore because I'm about to get set free. So he knew that Jesus was going to heal him. He knew he was going to have his sight restored. So he took that coat and he put it on the ground and he went to Jesus. Why? Because he knew once he met the Savior, he did not need that coat any longer. When you and I met Christ, all of the junk that has been piled on us, Jesus took away. But unlike Bartimaeus, we went and picked it back up again. 
through 6. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. See, freedom is a state of mind. Freedom is about how I see myself. If I see myself as a slave, I'm not free because I will not act like a free person. If I see myself as someone who does not have rights, I will act as someone who does not have rights because I see myself as not a free person. If I am a Christian and I still see myself bound in sin, Rather than as a saint made holy by an awesome God, one who sanctified me and clothed me in Christ's righteousness, I will not walk in it because I still see myself as a sinner. But God doesn't see you as a sinner anymore. And God doesn't see me as a sinner anymore. He sees Jesus Christ. We're holy. We're set apart. And we are commanded to live lives of holiness. Jesus set you and I free, but I do I really believe I'm free? If I believe I'm free, I'll live like it. I'll cast aside the old and not pick it up again. But if I'm so caught up in believing that God cannot forgive me, or that God cannot take away the hurts of my childhood, or God cannot get me past poor decisions that I make, that is saying that you are still a slave. And we are not slaves to the enemy. We are not to be slaves to this world. But when we accept Christ as Lord and Savior, we are free men. And we become bond servants to Christ. We belong to Him. And when God looks at us, He sees Christ's righteousness. He doesn't see a sinner. Next, we have to keep moving forward. Once we cast aside the weight, we will be tempted to pick it back up again. We'll be tempted to stop because of pain or circumstances or frustration, like the consistency I talked about earlier. We'll make bad decisions and want to give up. We'll make the bad decisions and still want to quit. But we must continue to press forward. That's why the author wrote, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Endurance means you're going to face trial. Endurance means it's a long race. Endurance means it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Endurance means you're going to face circumstances that are going to cause you to want to quit. But endurance says, I'm going to continue in spite of the trouble that I'm facing. And Paul says, because of the witnesses that came before us, we are to continue to move forward on the road that God has for us in endurance. Don't give up at the first sight of opposition or pain or suffering or poor circumstances, but to keep pressing forward in spite of that. That's endurance. Now you can look at me and tell that I am not a man of great endurance. I, I can't run very far. Right? You ask me to run, I'm in trouble. I'm the guy you trip during the zombie apocalypse, right? <laughs> Let, you know, I'm the guy that you get in front of and you're okay. Right? But, when it comes to running a race with Christ, we can't afford to be fat slobs. We got to be in shape Christian. Our spiritual men, our spiritual women inside of us need to be in shape. They got to have that cardio. They got to have that endurance. And you don't get cardio strength in your spirit. You don't strengthen your inner man by watching TV all the time and watching movies all the time and having poor relationships in our life. That's like me eating, sitting down and eating a whole bag of potato chips and dip. Right? It doesn't strengthen me. It just gives me a, a bad diet. It makes me fatter. But... In our spirit man, we must feed him celery and feed him strawberries and feed him blueberries and feed him healthy food so that he can grow strong and have endurance. We have to read God's word. That's the cardio. Reading God's word gives us the strength and the endurance and feeding ourselves with spiritual food to continue to press forward in spite of circumstances. Because when I give up, 
The Bible tells me don't give up. When I'm hurting, God says I'm there to give you joy and peace. But I cannot know those things and I cannot endure if I do not feed my inner man. See, we have our old nature and our new nature at war with itself. Yeah. My old nature is this flesh and bone. My new nature is my soul and my spirit. And one day I'll have a new body that will match the inner reality. Yeah. But until that time, I'm at war with the flesh and my members. Yeah. And I heard it described like this when I was a kid. And it has stuck with me my whole life. You have two dogs. The dog that you feed is going to be the dog that wins in a fight. Amen. If you and I feed the spirit man and starve the flesh, the spirit man is the stronger dog. Amen. But if I feed the flesh and I starve the spirit man, the flesh is the stronger dog. Yes. Amen. And so we have to keep moving forward by feeding our spirit man to have the endurance necessary to continue through the obstacles that are placed in our lives. Yes. That will happen because we are guaranteed trouble in this world. But Jesus Christ said, fear not, I have overcome the world. Amen. Amen. We must keep moving forward. <coughs> what do an airplane, a bicycle, and a Christian have in common? If they suddenly stop, you're in trouble. Airplane suddenly stops, you're in trouble. A bicycle, you ever been on a bicycle and hit a rock and the front wheel stops spinning? Over you go. As a Christian, the moment you stop moving, you start going backwards. Amen. It's like walking into a gale force wind. It's not easy. It's like swimming upstream. It's not easy. But as long as I keep walking, I keep that little fin moving, going upstream, I'm going to keep making progress little by little to get to the destination God has for me. But the minute I stop swimming, the minute I stop walking, I am pushed back by the cares of this world, the concerns of this world. I'm pushed back by the trouble that I face in this world because I'm no longer pressing forward. And finally, Hebrews chapter 12, the beginning of verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The witnesses that came before us are to encourage us to not take their sacrifice and to not take their lives for granted. But Jesus Christ is the ultimate reason we should keep moving forward. Why? Because he is the author, but even more importantly, he is the finisher Amen. of our faith. Amen. He authored it, and he finished it. Amen. He that has began a good work in you will finish Amen. that work. He that started in you will accomplish that work. We must center our eyes upon him. And he will keep us going in the right direction. And he can give us the strength, the comfort, the motivation that we need to keep pressing forward. But we've got to keep our eyes upon him. Many times when a child is learning to swim, and I, I did this with my boys, what I would do is I would set them on the edge of the pool and I would step back a few feet. And I'd say, all right, come on. And they'd get in that water, and they would be flapping every limb that they had, arms, legs. But you know what they did the whole time? They looked at me, and I looked at them. And I kept saying, you can do it, honey. You can do it. You can do it. And when they start to fall, I wouldn't go get them. My kids would look up. They'd see me again, and they'd keep doing it. Knowing that if they just kept paddling, they just kept moving those arms and those legs like this, they were going to make it to their daddy who was standing there right there encouraging them. They did not give up. And pretty soon it went from a couple feet to five feet to ten feet. So I could be on the other side of the pool and they would swim the length of the pool, the, the width of the pool to get to me the whole time. Keeping their eyes on me to make it forward as I said, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. Every time they started to sink.
sick, I didn't run and go help them. Every time they started out of trouble, I didn't run and go help them. I just kept encouraging them to keep pressing forward, keep pressing forward, keep pressing forward. Sometimes God's got to let you to take on water so that you'll look up at Him and keep moving forward. He's not always going to reach down and pick you up like he did with Peter. Sometimes he's going to let you tread water so that you'll look towards him and realize that if you'll keep your eyes centered upon him and not give up, you will make it. As Christians, we want uh, instant answers to our prayers and we want instant gratification. We want God to deliver us immediately. But if God delivered us immediately every time we were in suffering, we would never learn to swim and to keep pressing forward on our own. Amen. But if we will keep our eyes centered upon Christ, we can make it Amen. to our destination. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We must focus on Christ, who we cannot see with physical eyes, but we can see with spiritual eyes. Because he is eternal, and the world around us is not. And during the midst of that pain and suffering, if we'll keep our eyes upon him, he'll help us to keep moving when we want to give up. Thank you for listening to this message. We hope that you enjoyed it and were blessed by it. Each month, we have people from all over the world who listen to the messages made available. If you've been blessed by this ministry, would you consider making a donation of any amount to help support us as we continue to reach a loss for Christ? Donations can be made online at www.reviveoc.org or by check at Revive Outreach Church, 411 Chatham Heights Road, Suite 101, Fredericksburg, Virginia, 22405. Thank you for your prayers and your continued support. May God richly bless you.